Let's spend a few minutes looking at the issue of avoiding liquid locks. Anytime uh, an engine is designed which has uh, cylinders that are lower than the center line of the crankshaft, that engine will be susceptible to a liquid lock. Now a liquid lock occurs anytime that there is a volume of oil in the combustion chamber that is greater than the area between the top of the piston and the combustion chamber. In other words, there's a pool of oil in the cylinder, the piston is moving towards top dead center, and it strikes the oil before it reaches top dead center, and it begins to push on the oil. Now the oil will not compress. The engine does not have the force necessary to compress that oil. So what happens is something has to give, and that something is the link rod in the engine. The link rod almost always bends uh, in, during a liquid lock. And um, uh, all things being equal, uh, sooner or later that will cause a failure in the engine. Now the best insurance against a liquid lock is to always pull the engine through. Now when I say pull the engine through, what I'm talking about is pulling the crankshaft through in the normal direction of rotation at least two complete revolutions. Now in two complete revolutions we have caused, caused each cylinder to go through a complete cycle. Each intake valve and each exhaust valve has opened and closed. And if there has been any oil collect in the lower cylinders and to the place that we could have a liquid lock, we'll find it. If we'd been pulling this thing through and all of a sudden we had just hit a brick wall, just impossible to pull it beyond that point, that would indicate that one of our lower cylinders uh, is liquid locking. Now what do we do if, uh, if that happens? The only thing that we can do is to remove the front spark plugs and go ahead and pull it through the liquid lock. And as we pull it through, oil will run out of the cylinder that has liquid locked. Now, what happens if we push the propeller in the opposite direction uh, from normal rotation? Uh, I've heard of people doing that. Now, will that clear a liquid lock? Yes, it will temporarily. What it does is it forces the oil back into the intake pipe. And once that oil is back in the intake pipe, um, it becomes more difficult to get it out. The only way that I'm aware of that we can do that is either by lifting the tail of the airplane or by pulling the intake pipe completely off and draining the oil, or if your intake pipe has a drain, then you can use the intake pipe drain to drain the oil. So, uh, so never, never pull the engine through opposite to the direction, of the normal direction of rotation. Always in the in the normal direction of rotation, uh, pull the engine through at least two complete revolutions of the crankshaft. I personally pull them through six times, um, just because I like the uh, the added safety that uh, that I feel like I have really checked it to make sure that we don't have a liquid lock. Now, the other thing that you'll probably have noticed is as I pulled it through, there was compression. Um, we, we come upon compression, and in those two revolutions, we should have seven very strong compressions. Now, what that indicates is that each of the seven cylinders has gone through a compression stroke, and we know that, uh, that each of them is, uh, is pretty healthy. Now, we don't know exactly what the compression is, but we know that it's got good, com good compression. We can feel it. Uh, if we had only felt five good compressions, uh, that would indicate that, that we have a couple of weak cylinders and uh, some things that, uh, that may need some attention before very long. Now, why is the Jacobs engine uh, more susceptible than some of the other engines to, uh, to liquid lock? Um, the Jacobs engine was originally designed, as we talked earlier, as a manually greased rocker arm engine. In other words, it had the grease cirques um, and you would, you would grease the engine. There was no oil out in the rocker boxes at all. All the oil was contained inside the power case. And as a result, when Jacobs designed this engine, there's no sump, no traditional sump down here the way that you would see on a Pratt & Whitney or a Continental or a Lycoming. Um, the Jacobs does have a very small 
sump, uh, I guess is what it would be, uh, that, that faces aft on the engine, but it, uh, it doesn't contain much oil. It, it doesn't have much capacity. So um, as long as this engine was a manually greased engine, wasn't a problem. There wasn't all that much oil in there anyway, and that, uh, that little sump had capacity to, uh, to contain that. But then, uh, right around World War II, when they increased uh, the capacity of oil in the engine by adding automatic valve lubrication, um, there suddenly was a lot more oil in the engine, a lot more oil out in the rocker boxes, but no further provision was made uh, as far as the sump goes. So what happens is the oil fills up the sump, overflows the sump, winds up in the, in the lower cylinders uh, with the possibility then of a, um, of a liquid lock. Now there have been some modern developments that we'll look at in a second um, that, uh, that will help to alleviate uh, or avoid a liquid lock. Um, let's go into uh, final assembly and we'll look at the result of liquid locks and also at some of these modern developments. Now we have here some link rods. Uh, all of these link rods are bent. Uh, this rod doesn't look bent. Uh, it, um, it actually physically looks uh, like a very good rod. But if you put it on a surface plate with, uh, with V-blocks, you'll find that this rod um, has bent. Now this rod, again, to look at it with the naked eye, it doesn't look bent. But you'll notice this shiny spot. This shiny spot is where this rod has bent to the extent that it is now contacting the cylinder skirt with each revolution and it, uh, it's being machined just like it was chucked in a mill and being machined. Now you can see this rod has been milled even further. Uh, each revolution um, it, uh, it is just cutting away on that rod and even though the rod doesn't look bent it obviously is. This rod is what we call an imminent failure. Uh, it probably would not have lasted another two or three minutes in the engine. You can see that the rod has, uh, has bent dramatically and, um, and was striking the, the side of the cylinder um, to a great degree. Now these rods uh, came in in engines that were running fine. Uh, the customers didn't even know that they had a problem. All they knew was that their engine had reached TBO and uh, they had actually liquid locked their engines at some time in their history and uh, the engines were running fine. But with each uh, cycle the rod would flex a little bit more and sooner or later uh, would have reached this stage. What we have here is a, a Jacobs power section. Uh, I've chosen to use this to demonstrate the, um, uh, the modern remedies for the liquid lock uh, because it's much easier to see than the engine mounted on that Waco out there. Uh, this is the sump that we were speaking about, that, um, or what passes for one on a Jacobs engine. Uh, not much capacity, uh, right above the carburetor. This is a, uh, a plug that threads into one side of the sump, and this is the, um, the coarse oil screen that threads into the other. From here there's a tube um, which uh, returns oil back to the oil pump which uh, mounts in this location. So one of, the, uh, one of the remedies that, um, uh, that has been developed uh, for the Jacobs engine to help with this problem of, uh, of a low capacity sump is this device, which is, um, is called the clean kit. Now um, this uh, is STC'd by the 195 factory in West Glenville, New York. And um, this unit we remove this plug, we remove the screen, and basically what this is, is an auxiliary screen, uh, an auxiliary sump that just adds capacity to the existing sump. Uh, in fact, it adds about uh, two and a half times the capacity that the existing sump had. Now you can see this is a big hollow bolt that allows the oil to flow from the original sump into the auxiliary sump. And um, it has uh, crush gaskets fore and aft. And, uh, and then we take the screen and thread it into the back portion. And then this becomes the, um, 
the passageway for the scavenge oil back into the oil pump. Now, in addition to this uh, auxiliary sump, the clean kit also comes with a second sump. And this sump bolts in at the, uh, at the air box to the carburetor location. And it provides another sump for the oil that has drained down into the, uh, to the lower rocker covers. So uh, again, adding uh, dramatic sump capacity. So when the oil drains down uh, from the engine after the engine's been shut off, and it, it would normally overflow this sump, it flows back into this sump, it flows back into this sump. Uh, when the engine is started, the oil pump automatically scavenges all the oil back into the engine again. So the only time that these are really doing any work is when the engine is shut down. The rest of the time, they're just, uh, just a little storage container that uh, is, is helping to store oil. Actually increases the capacity um, of the oil system by, uh, by a small amount. So these devices really work. Uh, unfortunately, they've only been STC'd for the uh, Jacobs engine on the Cessna 195. And so, um, so that's their application is the, uh, is the 195. Now, one other device which we have gotten approved is, you remember we talked about the intake pipes a couple minutes ago and about how the, if the oil gets back in the intake pipe, uh, the only way to get it out is by lifting the tail of the airplane or by pulling the intake pipe off, or if you have a drain. Well, this is a little sniffle valve. And what this little sniffle valve does is, uh, let's just put this in the number four position here. Uh, if, if oil drains down into this intake pipe while the aircraft is sitting in the three-point attitude, this valve is at the lowest point of the intake pipe. And as long as there's no vacuum inside the intake pipe, this valve is open and so it's just draining oil out of it. As soon as the engine starts and vacuum is created in the, in the induction system, there's a little check ball in there that is drawn up and it shuts the valve off so there's no vacuum leak. The engine shuts down and the oil runs out this tube which we can then uh, uh, run a hose back to the back side of the cowling and we can let it puddle harmlessly somewhere outside the engine. So, um, so between, between the clean kit and the, uh, the sniffle valves on the intake pipe, and if you're always careful to pull your engine through, uh, that really will alleviate any concern that you need have uh, about liquid locks.